party. Are you guys getting as tired of this jingle as I am? Yeah. yeah there's one more Sunday. Hang in there. Uh, this is our series, Jeopardy! Questions That Matter. And, and the reason that it's lingering is because we are plotting our way carefully and faithfully through the book of Colossians, the, Paul's epistle to the Colossian church, uh, looking at it little by little. And today we're, we're launching into the last chapter, chapter 4. And uh, we're using this Jeopardy! format because, as you know, with the Jeopardy! format, they give you answers and you have to come up with a question. Now, this is your cheat sheet right now. Look at the bulletin and the sermon title, How Do We Relate to Others? That's the question that I'm going to quiz you on later in the sermon, so refer back to that. Let's pause, though, for a moment of prayer, shall we? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come like fire and burn. Come like wind and cleanse. Come like light and reveal. Convict. Convert. Consecrate until we are wholly yours. In Jesus' name, amen. So to give you a little recap of the book of Colossians, this is about as nutshell short version as I can make it. The first two chapters, Paul is basically talking about who Jesus is as the Son of God, his divine nature, and what he does, what he did. And it's based on who he was and what he did that chapters 3 and 4 come to us about how to behave and how to relate to others. You heard a couple weeks ago, Katie talked about the household relationships and the family and today, Paul is going to be talking about how it is we as Christ followers relate to outsiders outside of the faith. Because the truth is, what you believe about God in Jesus Christ is supposed to shape how you behave and relate to others. But that's not always consistent, is it? There was a, an interesting survey that was done. It's recorded in the Journal of Adult Development. And in this survey, they asked people, and 75% of respondents said that they believe God has forgiven their past mistakes, their past sins, their past misdeeds. They believe, 75% of those, yes, God has forgiven me. However, of those folks, that 75%, only 52% say they have forgiven others. And of those 75%, only 43% say they have actively sought uh, forgiveness from others for things they have done to harm others. Do you see the disconnect there? Do you see the inconsistency, the lack of continuity between what you believe about God and how you behave and relate to others? That's, that's why we are studying what we're studying today. Because what you believe about God and Christ is supposed to shape how you behave and how you relate to others. So to get at this, Paul says... Relating to yourself, others, and God always begins with prayer. Bathe it in prayer. And that's how he begins in our reading, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. This is what he says. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And then he turns the tables, looking at them and you and me. He says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer anyone and everyone. What's Paul saying? Well, a lot of things to unpack in these four short verses. And the first one is this, we are to pray for, pray for God to open a door for conversations. You ever thought about conversations that way? Lord, open a door for conversations with people. Open a door for specific people. Open a door for conversations with just anyone. The conversations that are filled with grace. Open a door for conversations that bring you glory, that connect people to Christ, that advance the kingdom of God through relationships. The Bible is all about relationships. That's how God works. It's not a belief system. 
It's a behavioral system, a how, how we relate to one another, ourselves, and to God. Now, I'm going to give you two words in just a second at my cue. The slide will come up because this is a very practical tool for how you and I can do this with others. It seems so simple, and yet we neglect it so very often and so very easily. The tool for you to engage others in this way, it's two words. Be curious. Be curious. Have you ever, you ever had conversations with someone, and it really seemed very one-sided, and they never asked you anything? Do you ask more questions than the statements that you make? I was listening in to a conversation my wife was having on the phone, and she had it on speakerphone. She doesn't always do that, but she happened to have this one on speakerphone. And, and I timed it after a while. I think it was 35 or 40 minutes. The person on the phone was, was simply going on and on and talking about themselves and never coming back and asking questions. And I thought, wow, it's like a stream of consciousness. And... And, and, and they were not curious about her and what's going on with her. Now, turn the tables, and if you're on the receiving side of someone who's curious, how does it make you feel when they are interested in you, what you're about, what you think, what you're doing? If you're like me, it makes you feel special. It makes you feel connected to them. It makes you feel attended to. It's just a practical way of doing what Paul is saying we should pray for. Be curious. Be curious. Because how you behave and relate to others is connected to what you believe about God and to what you know about others. I'm, I'm, I'm following a very interesting relationship. It's actually a romance, uh, a live romance on Facebook. I'm not a big Facebook fan. I don't like the whole idea of people living out their life on Facebook. But this is a, a, an interesting one because... It's an old friend, his name is Jimmy, and he's dating a woman, her name is Joy. Now, I know Jimmy from a long way back, but I don't know Joy very well, but I know some things about her that give some clues about what she's like. You see, she's a single mother of two children, two young children. She's also a senior pastor in a church. Now, I know that in order to be an effective senior pastor in a church and a single mother of two children, you've got to have your stuff together. You've got to be kind of organized. you got to got to be rooted and stable. you, you got to be able to juggle a lot of things and, and, and really have your act together. And everything I just said to you about joy, it's the opposite for Jimmy. Uh, th th this guy's one of the most fun-loving guys. He's one of the most likable and lovable guys in the world. But he's all over the map. Uh, one day he has this great idea and this great venture, and it's, you know, the next day it's something else, and then the next day it's something else. And, and he's not the kind of guy that you want to really kind of count on for deep commitments. And so I'm thinking to myself as I'm watching this play out in sort of a, a puppy love fashion at this point on Facebook, how well does Joy know Jimmy? <laughs> Is she, has she been very curious to get to know him? Now consider that story as I share with you a, a lesson really from Harville Hendricks' book. Getting the Love You Want, a book I highly recommend for relationships. He says this, people in love are masters at projection. Some couples go through their whole marriages as if they were strangers sitting in a darkened movie theater, casting flickering images on each other. They don't even turn off their projectors long enough to see who it is that serves as the screen for their home movies. Ouch, how true is that? We project onto others without really even knowing who the other is that serves as our screen. That, my friends, is why Paul starts this section out saying, devote yourselves to prayer. And that word, the Greek word for devotion, means to go on and on and on, to not stop. It is this idea of being busily engaged. Bathe all of your relationships in prayer. And so the Two lessons that we can come away with very easily at the outset are these. Speak to God before you speak for God. And speak to God before you speak to or about others. We want to bathe all of our relationships in prayer. So often we go off the cuff, don't we? Off the script. 
And if it's a challenging relationship, things can go awry. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. Devote yourself to prayer. What is prayer? Prayer, I love Tony Campolo's definition of prayer. I've always used it. He said, very simply, prayer is aligning my will with God's will. Aligning my will with God's will. Didn't Jesus teach us that? We just said the Lord's Prayer a few moments ago, didn't we? Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? But so often, our prayers are more about trying to get God to align His will God's will with my will, with your will, right? Our prayers are very childish in some ways. A lot like uh, Teresa, age eight. She prayed this, dear God, I know that you love me, but I wish you would give me an A on my report card so I could be sure. (laughs) Or then there's uh, Debbie, age nine, who wrote to her pastor and said, dear pastor, could you say a special blessing for my Aunt Beatrice? She's been looking for a husband for 12 years and still hasn't found one. Often we approach God like Santa Claus, don't we? Uh, and, and, and our prayers are actually kind of childlike. And we have to grow them up. There was a Gallup poll that was done, you know, Gallup polls and surveys. And, and there was a statement and a question, a statement that was made, and the response was yes or no, a question, yes or no. So 71% of people said yes to this statement. It has been said to, that those who pray will receive help. They said, yeah, yeah, I believe. Those who pray will receive help. And then 63% responded to this question. When you have prayed for help, did it work? 63% said, yeah. We expect help, and yeah, it does work. But it begs the question, doesn't it? What does it mean that it worked? Because we so misuse prayer in so many ways, don't we? Uh, one person wrote this in response. There is a different test for what works when we pray. Prayer works when it gives us a greater sense of the majesty and glory of God. Prayer works when it leads us to true repentance after confessing sin. Prayer works when it arouses in us an awesome sense of the forgiving grace of God. Prayer works when it engenders profound thanks for every day that we live and makes us realize that life is a gift to be received with gratitude and a task to be pursued with courage. Prayer works when it leads us to pray for others. Prayer works when it impels us to action on behalf of brothers and sisters in the world. Prayer works when it leads us to new commitments in our Christian pilgrimage. Prayer works when along with our asking, it leads to our giving. Do you see how prayer works and why it's so important to Paul that we bathe everything in prayer? Paul wants you and me to grow our prayers up, to align our will with God's will, and to ask for open doors so that we might share Christ in authentic ways with others. Now remember where Paul is as he's writing this. Where is he? He's in prison. He's not at the Hilton. He, he, he doesn't have a, a, a nice house out on Schools Point. He's in a dark, dank, ancient prison. And what is he asking for? He's not asking that they would pray that he would be released, is he? He asked for prayer that God would use him where he is. There's a lesson in that. He doesn't want to be delivered. He wants to be empowered in prison. And my friends, I don't know what imprisons you, but here's a truth, and you might even want to write this down. God wants to use you with others wherever you feel imprisoned, wherever you feel oppressed, wherever you feel trapped. Where is that? Some people feel imprisoned and and oppressed and trapped by illness. A lot of people that aren't here today are feeling that way right now. Some people feel imprisoned and trapped by regrets in the past. Some people feel imprisoned by rejection or loneliness or grief and loss, especially this time of year. Some people feel really trapped and oppressed by failure, by addiction, or by fear that seems to consume and imprison them. In in fact, we we often live lives that are a lot 
like this British sign hanging on an English company's door. And it said this, We have been established for over 100 years and have been pleasing our displeasing customers ever since. We have made money and lost money, suffered the effects of coal ra- nationalization, coal rationing, government control, and bad payers. We have been cussed and discussed, messed about, lied to, held up, robbed, and swindled. The only reason we stay in business is to see what happens next. (laughs) We stay in prayer to see what God will do next. That's how it works. Because we know that when we invite God in, when we align our will with God, we cannot go wrong. So don't pray for deliverance. Don't pray for deliverance. Pray for God's will and whatever that prison is for you. Pray for God's power right there in the midst of where you feel most disempowered. Pray for the light of Jesus in that darkness. This, is, uh, this was actually a scene in a book uh, by uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Ivan was in a dank Soviet prison. He was praying and a fellow prisoner said, you know that your prayers aren't going to get you out here any faster. He looked up at this fellow prisoner. He said, I'm not praying to be released from prison. I'm praying to do God's will in prison. You see the difference? When you're focused on your own prison, whatever that is, guess what you're not focused on? You're not focused on God's purposes where you are. You're not focused on the opportunities and the potential with people where you are. And so, always pray for God's power instead of God's release. Always pray for God's power instead of God's release. You know why that's more important? Because through God's power, you can endure anything and engage anyone wherever you are. And God will use you. Pray for opportunities to show Christ to others through what you say and how you say. You know how you say something is probably more important than what you say. That's why Paul goes on in verse 5. He says, be wise, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. The great New Testament scholar N.T. Wright retranslated that verse this way. He said, walk in wisdom. Follow Christ in God's pattern of full and authentic human living. Isn't that what we want? Full and authentic human living. Jesus came to save us, not just so that we might have life hereafter in heaven, but so that we might come alive like he was alive in full, authentic human living. It's about relationships. As he says, it's about making the most of opportunities with outsiders, with others. You know why this is important? Because they're always watching you and me. If you call yourself a Christ follower, guess what? They're, they're watching you. They're watching me. I had to cut down some branches from a tree next door. Now, there are renters living next door. It's kind of two houses, and this one guy living back there, his name's Ray. Uh, he and I were talking, and, and I had to climb over the fence. It's a big picket fence. And, and Ray said, yeah, you got a nice backyard. I looked over the fence and been checking it out. A little creepy. And there was a stool and a, 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 a chair sort of butted up against the fence. I could tell that he used it to step on the fence. So I immediately told my wife, don't do anything in the backyard. You don't want Ray to see here. And the truth is, listen to this, guys. People are looking over the fence of your faith in every conversation you have. Let me say it again. People are looking over the fence of your faith in every conversation you have, no matter how innocuous it might seem, no matter how trivial it might be. Not only by the words you choose, but the way you express yourself. My wife gave me permission to share this story. Um, as a, it's a great illustration. This is a number of years ago, and she and two other ladies were uh, exploring starting a business together. And uh, she was talking to Terry on the phone, and, 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 and Terry was sharing with her about the three of them. And Terry said, imagine that, speaking to Lisa, two atheists and a Roman Catholic starting a business together. Now, Lisa knew that the other woman was the Roman Catholic. 
oh, right? Terry thought that Lisa was an atheist, and it was such a convicting moment for her because she had been looking over the fence of Lisa's faith and didn't see what she needed to see at that moment. And that's the truth for all of us, guys, whether we know it or not. Listen, if your conversations were a billboard, what would they advertise about Jesus? If your conversations were a billboard, what would they advertise? This is why Paul goes on in verse 6 to say, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, we have this euphemism in American lingo, parlance, called salty language. You know, that's not a compliment. You know that, right? It actually goes back, I, I looked this up, it goes back to 1938 U.S. Navy sailors who, um, uh, who, who, who were said to have salty language because it was aggressive, tough, tough language, maybe some cursing, that kind of thing. That is not what Paul is getting at when he says season your conversations with salt. Rather, it's literally the image of salt. What do we use salt for with food? To make it taste good. To make it taste good. In other words, he's saying, make your conversations taste good. Make them palatable. Make people want to come back for more. And this is so important because, tell me if you believe this. Do you know that the people you encounter are there by divine appointment? There are no accidents. The people that cross your path, whether it's in the grocery line or whether it's a neighbor or whether it's someone very close to you, are there by divine appointment. Do you believe that? Because if you do, you might want to listen to Paul. We might want to hone in on what he's saying here. Rebecca Piffert believes it in her book, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. She tells this wonderful story about encountering a woman, a perfect stranger, in the middle of the day in Chicago, O'Hare International Airport. This, this woman accidentally spills her purse. Any of you ladies ever had that experience in public? And so right in front of Rebecca, and she, so Rebecca leans over, and she starts to help the lady and introduces herself, and the woman looks up very nervously, and she says, you wouldn't know where I could get a drink around here, do you? You, you, you don't know where a bar is, do you? Oh, Rebecca didn't know, and she said, no, it's kind of odd, and she continues to help her, and she again asks, would you know where a bar is around here? And then a light bulb goes off, ding, divine appointment. She thinks to herself, how unorthodox to go to a bar in the middle of the airport, in the middle of the day with a perfect stranger. But perhaps God wants to use me in this. And so she did. And it was a profound encounter. Why? Because she prayerfully allowed God to lead her into that intersection of need. And then after that, she wrote these words in her book. Often we are blind. We act as if those around us were not really people like us. If we see them bleed, we pretend they aren't really hurting. If we see them alone, we tell ourselves they like it that way. But Jesus wants to heal our sight. He wants us to see that the neighbor next door or the people sitting next to us on the plane or in the classroom are not interruptions to our schedule. They are there by divine appointment. Jesus wants us to see their needs, their loneliness, their longings, and he wants us, he wants to give us the courage to reach out to them. And to do that, we have to do two things. Take risks and get beneath the surface of people's lives. I already gave you two words that are a good tool for doing that, didn't I? Remember? Be curious. Be curious and pray. Paul tells us, pray. Pray for and look for opportunities with others and season your conversations with grace, with God's grace, with human graciousness. Lord knows the world needs more grace, right? Human graciousness. And who's going to show others in our culture how to do this if Christians who are given God's word for how to do it and why to do it don't show them? Do you know this is the DNA of our congregation? You know what our mission is, right? The mission of Stuart Congregational Church is to follow Christ and share His grace. It's quite simple, but it's all-encompassing. It's lifelong. You can't give someone what you don't have. That's why we follow first. Follow faithfully so that we can give away, share, 
His grace. And the result of doing that mission is our vision. And that is that every individual, every family, and every community would thrive, you guessed it, in God's grace. And we have nine values, which is how we live these things out. One of which is that we are people of grace. Grace leads our relationships. Why is this our mission, our vision, and our value? Because the Bible teaches us this. Listen, people will not remember your words, but they'll remember if they were treated with grace. They'll remember if you were an ambassador of grace. They won't remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. People never remember what you say, but they always remember the tone and how it made you feel. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? But remember, the goal for Paul, as for us, is always Jesus Christ. It's always the gospel, the good news, and we want to remove anything that would keep people from encountering the gospel, the good news of Christ, his hope, his love, his joy, his peace, through us. That's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this wonderful little book. Uh, Bonhoeffer was the theologian who was executed in a Nazi concentration camp, by the way. And he he wrote this wonderful little book about how it is we relate to one another. Exactly what Paul's teaching us today as the body of Christ and to those outside. And a short little passage in that book goes like this. Human love is directed to the other person for his own sake. Spiritual love loves him for Christ's sake. That's the difference, my friends. You love others to love Jesus. You love others to to show Jesus. All right, I've given you a lot of answers today. We're going to invite Alex Trebek now, and we're going to play Jeopardy. I told you where your cheat sheet is. Look at the sermon title, and I'm going to give you the answers, a number of answers I've already told you. We're going to recap, and then I'm going to ask us all together to share the question, which is how we play Jeopardy. The answers are by praying for our behavior to match our beliefs, by praying for an open door for conversations filled with grace, by speaking to God before speaking for God, by speaking to God before speaking to or about others, by aligning my will with God's will, by praying for God's power instead of God's release, and by loving others to love Jesus. Those are the answers. And all together, what is the question? How do we relate to others? How do you relate to others? My friends, that is a question that matters. And it is a matter for prayer. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are humbled by how it is that you come to us and give us what we need in our inability. We are amazed by the priority of relationships that you came not just to deposit a belief system, but to empower relationship with you, with ourselves, with the body of Christ, and with others who are looking over the fence of our faith. We ask that through your spirit, that you would put a deep-seated grace in our hearts and season our conversations. We ask that all that we're about be bathed in prayer, compel us to do so so that others might see and know the light of Christ in us and through us. To you, Lord Jesus, be all the honor and glory and praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together as we worship.
morning we have something special uh, to celebrate at this moment and so that everyone has a good view I'm going to go ahead and invite you to take a seat one more time before we close our service uh, God is opening new doors for us as we march forward into the year 2020 and um, has provided some amazing gifted people with some staff realigning that we are introducing to you today and I'm going to I know Mark and, and Jen are up here, uh, and Nate, he's back there. Nate, can you come on out from the cave? Uh, you, know, you know there's a person back here, by the way. And Dorian, is Dorian in the room? Dorian, come on forward, Dorian. Dorian Nygaard, Mark Nygaard, Jen Timmerman, Nate Ailes. Um, amazingly gifted, talented folks who have served us in so many different capacities. And we've done some staffing realignment. And, and Mark, uh, who will continue to keep his 
toe in worship is going to move over to become our family pastor over our youth and our children. And Dorian as our director of children, as his part-time assistant. Uh, Jen is going to be our interim part-time worship leader. And Nate is going to be our part-time worship technology and video director. It's a long title. Yeah, how about that? I think I got it right. And I'm, I am personally so grateful to you guys and for the way that God has gifted you and led you to this point so that we might be a unified team together, so that we might lead the people of God every generation, in every way, in every ministry, through who we are as leaders, but more importantly, through who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. And so you've heard it already, but I'm going to share with you again uh, Ephesians chapter 4. This is their charge and our charge for them. Paul wrote these words, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I'm going to ask, uh, Katie, if you come forward and, and just lay a hand on that end, and I'm going to invite us to symbolically lay hands on them as we commission them for the ministry to which God has called them. And if you would like to, if you feel comfortable doing so, just extend your hand forward as a symbol of blessing them and being a part of us commissioning them together. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for these brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for gifting them and calling them. We pray that by the power of your spirit, you would unify us as a team, as a staff, as leaders, but that we would be such out of the abundant overflow of our growth in you that we might follow you so closely that we have much to share in our leadership with others and so we lift up the way forward oh god and pray for your blessings upon us as a staff as leaders and as a congregation not so that we might be a bless me club but so that we might be a blessing to the community to which you call us to those who are looking over the fence of our faith. Anoint them with your spirit, O oh God. Anoint us all so that we might move forward to bring you glory and honor and praise through all that we do as leaders and as the body of Christ. And the people of God pray this in Jesus' name, saying together, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much. Listen, if God has spoken to your heart in any way today, in which you'd like to have prayer. We always want to provide that each and every worship service. If there's a need, if there's a difficulty, if there's a pain, or, or maybe there's someone else that's on your heart and mind, we always have a Stephen minister available. And today, Denise Trellick, Denise is right over here, and she would love to welcome you. If you'd like a moment of prayer, a listening ear, a sounding board, don't hesitate to come forward and see Denise immediately following the service. And so now I'm going to invite you to stand for our blessing and benediction. Beloved, Whatever you do, remember to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you. May the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now in peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's children said, amen, amen. You might want to hang out for just a minute. Uh, Chaz and Loretta are going to play a song for you just as a little teaser for tonight. So I hope you guys can make it back to the concert at 5 o'clock tonight. But Chaz is going to bless you right now as you are exiting in just a minute.
Hold on, put your hands together. We're hoping you come back so you have some fun with us. And we can do it all in praising God. He's the reason for the season. And wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders and wonders of his love. Thank you. See you tonight at five.